Kia ora, I'm Erin J Doyle. Welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing a tag video. It is the Environment and Books tag. The original video was posted on Expedition Through Pages, but I actually saw it on Ariel Bissett's channel this morning. Both videos are quite interesting, so I'll link both down below, along with the questions and stuff. So, without further ado, question one. What is your favourite book cover with nature on it? I only came up with one that was very naturey and not like distant hills but mostly just the person in front or you know a cool setting but actually it was a dirty city or something but anyway the book that I picked was Origin which is just you no, know, really foresty and beautiful and to be honest I bought this book a hundred percent because of the cover Question 2. Have you read a fiction book where climate change was a theme? If not, are there any on your TBR? So I only found two books on my shelves where climate change is sort of a significant thing that's happening in the book. So the first one was The Wind Up Girl. This is set in the very far future. The world is basically destroyed. It has a very kind of post-apocalyptic feel about it as a consequence. Um, you know, it's the climate's all over the place, the sea levels have risen, there are restrictions on what fuels the people are able to use and all these sorts of things. So it is a theme in that regard. This book also casts um, genetic modification as an extreme evil. Many species have become extinct because genetically modified organisms have outcompeted them. So things like house cats and elephants have been replaced by fancier genetically modified versions. Um, there are issues with food security because of uh, rampant crop diseases and you have to buy genetically modified crops to survive the diseases and all these sorts of things. I have a slight issue with that. Um, now you could say this is biased because I'm a geneticist, um, but I would claim it would also be because of knowledge, because of being a geneticist. Um, I don't tend to enjoy stories where scientists are responsible for destroying the world because they're irresponsible. Scientists seek knowledge and then sometimes other people, the people who actually have control, like big decision makers and the people with money, they're the ones who exploit knowledge and cause harm. The knowledge itself is not bad. Um, and I think it also, this um, idea feeds into a lot of fears that people have about GMOs, which are based on misinformation. So I had, you know, problems with other themes in the book, but Nonetheless, it is a climate change book that's in my collection. I also have The Warming. This is completely different from the other one. This one, instead of the world becoming a more violent place with a whole bunch of insecurities around um, food and resources, it's just... It's really hot and... Um, land is being lost to sea level rise and so the human population at the beginning of the story has um, moved out of certain areas and as the story progresses more and more land is lost um, and they have to move to stay ahead of the sea level rise. Um, it has things like people deciding to or not to have children because of how they um, feel about the sort of potential future of humanity and um, yeah it has basically humanity instead of fighting over resources it has them being very peaceful and um, you know reinvesting in the arts and that kind of thing and making the world that is left to them more beautiful so it's sort of a peaceful version of a climate change disaster kind of story. 
Um, the story itself, I, a little weird, like, basically it's the story of this guy's relationship with his wife, going from when he first meets her, when he is a minor and she is a grown-ass woman married to someone else, through to the breakup of her first marriage and him swooping in and but then also like making buddies with her ex and secretly going off and hanging out with his wife's ex which is very weird um it feels very much like um the issues around climate change are kind of a setting to a weird love story. I'm not even sure if it's that. It's odd, not my cup of tea, I think is what I got from it. Um, scientifically, um, I felt like the solutions that they had to um, the loss of land due to sea level rise was a bit questionable, so I'm going to have to go into spoilers here. They start salvaging materials from abandoned cities to build like mega ships, and so the human population is starting to move into these floating city type things. And I think that's. Um, not the building of boats that I have issue with, it's the idea that you have unlimited supply of materials to build them from if you salvage from abandoned cities because abandoned cities are going to be damaged and there's going to be issues around um, the efficiency of recycling those materials and things like that. Um, it also kind of reads as if sea level rise is going to be so bad if there's like literally no ice left at all there will also be literally no land left like the sea level just gets higher and higher and higher and it kind of I think goes a bit too far in that regard even if we lost every single bit of ice on the planet we wouldn't have no land left like that's just not right I don't think um, but ignoring that, and the creepiness, I guess it was fine. I don't know. Question 3. Are there any books set in the polar regions that you want to read or have read? I think I've probably read a few set in kind of the sub-arctic. Um, but, yeah, generally no, I don't. I don't think there's anything that's really coming to mind. I'm thinking I've read a couple set in Subarctic because I have read uh, The Northern Lights, which is of course now called The Golden Compass, which, I mean, it seemed pretty far north, but I don't think it was really polar quite. But it's been so long since I read it that I can't remember. Um, and then I know I read one in high school, which again, I don't even know the title of, but it seemed really northern. Number four, what are your opinions on the relationship between book consumerism and the environment? Should people buy fewer physical books to help minimize deforestation, for example? As someone who has a lot of physical books, obviously I'm going to be biased into believing that what I do personally is okay. But I honestly don't think that having many books is the worst thing ever. Like if you were hoarding something else, it would be worse. Like electronic devices and clothing, things which are very damaging to the environment at the moment of their creation and which continue to release you know, microplastics or other toxins into the environment when they are discarded or when they start to break apart or break down. Even clothing that we are wearing day to day, unless it's 100% natural fibres, when it's washed it releases microplastics into the waters and that kind of thing. Whereas books just sit there being harmless. So, you know, if you're going to have one massive consumerist vice, I don't think they're the worst thing in the world. I think it's worth remembering that not all paper is created equal and not all forests are equal. 
If your paper is coming from old growth rainforest, that's significantly worse than if it's coming from a managed, sustainable plantation forest. Only one of those two forests is home to indigenous species. Whilst we do see a little bit of incursion of uh, varying wildlife and plant life along the edges of plantation forests, that only goes in a certain distance. So when those plantation forests are cut down, there isn't a significant loss of habitat or species. And then those trees are of course replanted. This isn't what we see in the destruction of things like rainforest, where highly diverse um, native species are eradicated and are not replaced with the same thing. So taking uh, wood for making paper from a plantation forest isn't the same. Whilst most people do currently use trees to make paper, that's not the only option. And shifting away from wood paper into say hemp paper would reduce the environmental impact and the issue of deforestation wouldn't come into the equation. So I think we could make changes in the way that we produce books and the materials they're made from, i.e. paper, that would make the um, production and consuming of physical books less of an environmental issue. Number five. What role do you think books and reading have in regard to educating people about the environment? Do you think it is the most effective way to teach people about environmental issues? I think books are only going to be effective in further educating a person who is already interested, but they are not sexy enough to encourage a disinterested person to start thinking along those lines. I think that things like documentaries and real world experiences are going to be far more successful when it comes to educating the disinterested member of the public. I do think that fiction has a role to play when it comes to normalising conversations. This we see a lot around humanitarian issues because books encourage empathy. And I think the use of setting is a way that we can encourage people to think about the environment. However, I think that so many readers skip over descriptions of setting that the effect that the book can have is relatively limited unless the reader is already really interested. So I think it's really only non-fiction that has the ability to educate, but then you have that issue of people not generally accidentally stumbling across a non-fiction tome on an environmental issue and reading it unless they already care quite a bit. Number six. Have you read a non-fiction book on climate change that you think we should all read? No. I don't think I've ever read a non-fiction book on climate change. I've read books on other things where climate change will have been involved just because of having studied ecology. But um, yeah, I don't have a recommendation, unfortunately. Number seven. Where is the most beautiful place in nature that you have read a book? I don't think I have ever read a book outside. For me, it's a very like cozy up at home activity. I have a couple of times regretted not having a book with me while I was out adventuring, like when I was camping in the Teton National Park. I didn't bring a book because I thought I would be busy during my days. I thought that I would basically spend every rest time going out on little excursions away from the campsite on horseback, but I fell off my horse on the first day and I was black and blue from knee to hip. And whilst I did still ride every day, it hurt quite a lot, so I didn't spend as much time on horseback as I'd planned, and it would have been great if I'd had a book, but I didn't think that would happen, so I didn't have one. Um, and then, having learned my lesson from that, when I walked the Camino de Santiago, I decided the first time that I would take a book with me, um, and then I ended up throwing it out on, like, the second day, I think, because my pack was too heavy and I needed to lighten the load a bit. So yeah, I have regretted it a couple of times, but generally I don't think about it. It's a very um, cozy indoor activity to me. And finally, question eight. If you could live in any natural setting in a book, such as the Hundred Acre Wood and the Winnie the Pooh stories, which one would you choose and why? 
I feel like I don't have a really solid answer for this one because basically I'm just after like trees and mountains which looking at the books on my shelves I'm like that leaves me with basically any fantasy setting really but then inevitably I have to deal with some kind of monsters or magic or war. Hmm. If I must choose I'm gonna go with the Forest and the Soldier's Sun trilogy. The people who live there migrate with the seasons and they live a very um, at one with nature kind of existence where they bury their dead in the trees and they sort of commune with the trees as their ancestors and it's all very pretty. Of course it's fantasy so there's also like magic and war and stuff as previously mentioned but you know I'm down with trees so I guess that's where I would pick. That's the end of the tag, I hope you found it entertaining. If you've enjoyed this video, maybe consider giving it a like. If you're new around here, hit subscribe and ring that bell so you can keep up to date, and I'll see you next time. Bye!